Welcome to the Lexington Public Library's Tales from the Kentucky Room podcast, where we discuss everything Lexington and Fayette County history. I'm Miriam, and in each episode of this podcast, we will feature a guest that will share a piece of local history. So thank you for tuning in and enjoy. Good day, everyone. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the podcast. Today, we have our favorite guest, Wayne Johnson, back on the podcast to talk to us about the senator that was president for a day. Welcome, Wayne. Okay, here we go. David Rice Atchison was born on August 11th, 1807, on the 20th anniversary of the first newspaper published in Kentucky, the Kentucky Gazette, in which our Kentucky room has on print and microfilm from almost the very beginning. Okay, that's a not so subtle subliminal advertising for our Kentucky <laughs> room resources, which I try to fit in with each of my podcasts. Free of charge but I, might, I may have to start charging the library. <laughs> we have to okay. sponsor your podcast now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. David Rice Atchison was born in Fayette County, Kentucky, in a community called Frogtown. The Frogtown community was located in an area that we now know as Kirk Levington, which is located off Tate's Creek Road, uh, between the New Circle Road exit ramp and Manowar, if you're familiar with the area. He was named after the famed Southern minister, David Rice. He was the eldest of six children of William and Catherine Allen Atchison, and his father was a wealthy planter. Atchison attended common schools in the county and went to Transylvania University and graduated with high honors in 1825. He then studied law and it was admitted to the bar in 1830. If he knew what was in store for himself, it probably would not be the last bar he desired admission to. (laughs) <laughs> After completing his schoolwork, he moved to Missouri and set up a law practice, and by most accounts, he built up a pretty good one. He then decided to enter politics and was elected to the Missouri State Legislature, and then he was appointed a circuit judge. Now, Atchison was described as an imposing figure, six foot two, 200 pounds, and straight as an arrow. Wow, so a big guy. Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, very imposing, apparently, according to the accounts I've read. Now, in 1843, a U.S. senator from Missouri passed away and the governor appointed Atchison to the vacancy. He eventually served three terms and retired from the Senate in 1855. Now, at some point during his Senate years, Atchison ascended to the president pro tem uh, position of the Senate, which would have an impact on his life, uh, which, of course, he never could have imagined. Can you explain what a pro temp is a little bit, Wayne? Hi, everyone. This is Erin, producer of Tales from the Kentucky Room. Normally, I don't break in like this, but we got the president pro tempore of the United States Senate description really wrong. So I'm going to set the record straight. So the president pro tempore of the United States Senate is the second highest ranking official of the Senate behind the majority leader. During David Rice Atchison's time as president pro tempore, the president of the Senate was second in line to the presidential succession following the vice president. At that time also, there wasn't a specific criteria to who could be the president pro tempore of the United States Senate. Nowadays, it's typically the longest serving member of the majority party. Before we get to the part about president for a day, Let me just go ahead a little bit and say in 1855, Mm -hmm. Atchison was defeated for re-election and returned to his private law practice. He served in the Missouri State Militia as a major general and during the Civil War served in the Confederacy. He was a co-founder of the famed Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe Railroads, and both Atchison, Kansas, and Atchison, Missouri is named for him. So he was pretty well-renowned back in the day. He was a lifelong bachelor, and he died on January 26, 1886, in Gower, Missouri. Now, he he was an elusive figure in our history, and part of the reason why is that most of his papers were destroyed in a fire at his farm later on in his life, and there wasn't his papers and his histories as senator were destroyed, or mostly destroyed, so there wasn't a lot of documentation to his life in the public. Now, let's go back to March of 1849. I gave you a brief biography of Atchison just to get you a feel for what he did in his life. 
But let's go back to that uh, day in March 1849 and get to the part where Atchison uh, allegedly became president for a day. Okay. How did it happen? Well, according to a story in the Crimson, I, I think it was a yearbook in Transylvania, somebody wrote an article, I believe it was in the 19, early 1900s about uh, Atchison's day as president. And oh, by the way, the story, if I if I remember correctly, because I'm doing this podcast mostly from memory because I did my <laughs> months ago. And then when COVID hit and we were closed down. <laughs> Everything is a blur, Wayne. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, I've lost my research, but I, I'm going with my memory here. But uh, apparently the story was written by a fella Transylvania student or, or professor or somebody affiliated with uh, Transylvania by the name of George Bush. Oh, huh, interesting. Yeah. No, not, the, not those George Bushes, <laughs> but that was his name. Uh, that, that's a true story. Can't make this stuff up. If I could, I oh, would. No. If I thought I could get away with it, I would. But, no. Uh, Living this year, you can't make anything up. <laughs> no, no. It's got to be, it's got to be the facts. So um, anyway, uh, now Trancy as we all know here in Lexington, has had its share of prominent alumni during the course of its history. It's had students that became governors, senators, representatives, cabinet members, and even a Supreme Court justice. And now with Atchison, according to the stories, they can say they had a U.S. president. Now on Saturday, March 3rd, 1849, the closing session of Congress had gone on through most of the night. It was on a Saturday in the, in the session of Congress. The final session went through most of the night on Saturday. And during this closing session, there's historical records that the representatives and senators had a drink or two or three during this closing session, including Atchison. They did not believe in term limits or drink limits, apparently, back then. <laughs> and as the story goes, when Atchison finally left that night, and, and I haven't really determined whether he realized he was president for the day before or after the fact. <laughs> well, with that many drinks, I'm probably not. <laughs> yeah. Well, anyway, as the story goes, when Atchison left that night after the closing session of Congress, he instructed his landlady, and like I said, you got to remember he was a bachelor and he boarded up at some place and he had a landlady. He instructed her that he did not want to be disturbed on any account. Now, back in those days, the pres presidential inauguration fell on March 4th, not like the present day, January 20th. It only became the date to inaugurate presidents beginning, I think, in the second term of Franklin Delano or Roosevelt beginning in January 1937. But before that, it was on March 4th. Okay. And I think the reason why they changed it to January 20th is because you'd have less of a time period where you'd have a lame duck president mm. and the president elect. So they, they changed it to January 20th. In 1849, March 4th happened to fall on a Sunday. And the incoming president, Zachary Taylor, apparently a very religious man, did not want to be inaugurated on a Sunday. He did not believe in work or official duties on Sunday and wanted to wait till Monday. Well, this posed a problem. His predecessor, President James Polk, along with Polk's vice president, George Dallas, who, by the way, the city of Dallas is named for, their terms ended officially at noontime on March 4th. The Secession Act of 1792, which was in effect, provided that in case of removal, death, resignation, or inability of both the president and vice president, the president of the Senate shall act as president of the U.S. until the disability is removed or a president is elected. So anyway, it appears for those 24 hours between the time Polk left office and Taylor was sworn in, Atchison was acting president. Now, it seems that this is a matter for much debate on whether Atchison was actually president for a day. He was not sworn in. He did not take the presidential oath and nothing officially made him president other than the Secession Act of 1782, where it says if you don't have a president or vice president, the president of the Senate shall act as president. Didn't his term expire, too, though? I think he was still senator. I don't think okay. his term was over with. All right. Uh, I'm, I Don't quote me on that, even though I'm on recording. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but he was still the Senate leader by, okay. by the accounts I've, I've read. Okay. 
Now, you may wonder what Atchison did during his day as president. Well, you know, he didn't conduct a war on poverty, which Lyndon Johnson did. He he didn't visit Gettysburg like Lincoln did, and he didn't make a phone call to the moon <laughs> like Nixon did, or Ukraine for that matter. <laughs> um, now, in fact, if you remember, his instructions to his landlady was to not to be disturbed on any account. Well, according to the story she, she told from the reports I've read, Atchison, after his n- night of drinking on that Saturday night, not only slept through the whole day on Sunday, but also slept through the presidential inauguration on Monday afternoon. (laughs) Yes, according to her, he slept through his entire administration. Uh, And when he woke up, talk about getting up on the wrong side of the bed, uh, missing your entire day as president. I know. It gives a whole new meaning to the phrase, let me sleep on it. (laughs) Now, there was much debate on whether Atchison was officially the president of the United States for that one day or not, but it sure does make a good story. It does. You know, according to the Secession Act that we quoted earlier, apparently he was president for a day, but he slept on it. (laughs) Now, there's a... Right through uh, it. Yeah. Now, apparently there's still a historical marker in front of the Lansdowne Shopping Center on Tate's Creek Road, noting the significance of Atchison and his day as president. Apparently, this historical marker for years and years was actually on Versailles Road, if I'm remembering correctly. And apparently, they had mistaken where Frogtown was located, or maybe there was another community named Frogtown in the Versailles Road area. But for years, a historical marker was on Versailles Road. And when they finally... Small mistake. That's okay. (laughs) Just a a few miles difference. (laughs) But eventually it was moved over to the Lansdowne Shopping Center where the Frogtown Atchison grew up in. I'll have to to pop by over there and check it out, see if it's still there. Yeah, I haven't driven by there in a while, but I have to be on the lookout for it. But that was... uh, that was Atchison's day as president, according to uh, legend, and he didn't do anything but but sleep, according to <laughs> to to the to his landlady. <laughs> so and, anyway, it makes for an in- interesting story. And since he's from Lexington, Kentucky, or at least born here, yeah, we decided to do a podcast on it, and people can get online or come down here to the Kentucky Room to learn more about it. Yeah, but he did not do anything as president other than sleep. Oh, well. So no, no scandals in his administration. <laughs> hard, hard to have a scandal when you're sound asleep. I guess sleeping is better than golfing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Through your presidency. Thank you, Wayne, so much. That was a very fun and interesting story. Okay, thanks. Thanks for listening to Tales from the Kentucky Room, a podcast brought to you by the Central Library's Kentucky Room staff at the Lexington Public Library. If you enjoyed listening, please take a minute to subscribe, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher. If you have any questions about local history or genealogy research, you can visit us in the Kentucky Room to use our collection and newspaper microfilm. Or you can email us at elibrarian at lexpublib.org. That's elibrarian at l-e-x-p-u-b-l-i-b dot org. I'm Miriam, and we'll be back with another trip down Lexington's memory lane. <laughs>